Glory to Jesus Christ. So that's on, I think. All right. Um, I have a little outline. If anyone, if you're note takers, I've got some paper and outline that you can take notes on. If you're not, you can just pass it on. But I'll just uh, start one up here, start one at the back. I need one of those myself. That'll be helpful. Thank you. All right, it's a it's a pleasure to give a little little talk for you on something that um, something that forms such a central part of the the Orthodox Church here the the the, the, the keeping of the of the Great Lent of the of the Great Fast that comes to us right before uh, right before Pascha. One of the things that we that we hear in the service that begins the begins our uh, our entrance into great lent the forgiveness vespers service one of the things that we hear one of it, one of the stikira that we that the the choir sings it's right at the top of your page and it gives us it it encapsulates uh, beautifully almost every aspect uh, that uh, of lent here it is let us set out with joy upon the season of the fast and prepare ourselves for spiritual combats let us purify our soul and cleanse our flesh and as we fast from food, let us abstain also from every passion. Rejoicing in the virtues of the Spirit, may we persevere with love and so be counted worthy to see the solemn passion of Christ our God and with great spiritual gladness to behold his holy Pascha. As I said, this gets at almost every important aspect of, uh, of, of the season of the fast. It's a season of spiritual combat. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. It's a season for the purification of our souls and of our flesh. We fast from food, but we also fast from indulging our passions, from biting and devouring each other, as the Apostle Paul says. We take delight in the virtues of the Spirit. We persevere with the goal in mind that at the end of all of this, the purpose for it all is our ability to see and to, to comprehend, to enter into the saving passion, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to rejoice at his great uh, and holy Pascha at the resurrection. This is what we do and the whole purpose and goal of, of why we do it, encapsulated in this beautiful hymn. Um, what I'd like to do today in, in kind of unpacking some of those elements that are present in there is go through what you see on your, um, on your outline. I want to look at, really briefly, just a little bit about the development of the fast not simply because history is a fun thing in and of itself, but also because the history of the fast tells us something about its present meaning. Uh, I want to look then at the three aspects that constitute the fast, the three things that, um, that are central uh, actions, things that we do. Fasting, prayer, both liturgical and personal, and also almsgiving. So that's kind of where, where we're headed. Thank you. As far as the, how, how uh, the Great Lent began, the earliest records that we have of some sort of fast taking place in advance of, of Pascha, of the celebration of Christ's resurrection, occur already in the second century. There's records of there being a, a fast of a couple of days in some places, two, three or four days in certain places, and it was, a, it was a, a, as it seems, a total fast in preparation on the couple of days, perhaps beginning on Holy Friday, the couple of days leading up to the celebration of the resurrection of Christ. So right in the very early stages of the church, there's this notion that preparing for Pascha requires, that preparation is required for it. This is right in the earliest, um, earliest days of, uh, of the church. By the third century, we begin to see references to it extending out to a week. And this becomes essentially our current Holy Week, the, the week, of the days leading up to, um, uh, leading up to the, the celebration of the resurrection. So that's kind of the, the first component of the fast, the, the earliest component. There's also, well, how did we get from Holy Week then to the 40 days that constitutes Lent? That's sort of a development in a bit of a, a different strand. The first mention of a 40-day fast prior to Pascha is, um, is in 325 in the, the records of the, the, council, the First Council of Nicaea. But there, it refers to it as something that's already well established. So it indicates that probably at the very least since the third century, there had been some form of a 40-day fast going on. And the purpose of that 40-day fast 
was tied very closely with, with the education of catechumens, with those people who were preparing to come into the church by baptism, which in the earliest church was always done on the eve of Pascha, on, on, that, uh, on that night. So this was a time where they were being taught, kind of an intensive uh, teaching. In some places, they would have services and teaching every single night for 40 days <laughs> leading up to, uh, those of you who are catechumens out there, <laughs> you can perhaps be glad that you didn't live 2,000 years ago. Um, that this, but this was an, uh, an intensive training leading up to the, the, uh, the baptism and bringing in of catechumens uh, into the church. It began to happen then too, or inevitably, it was also encouraged that people who were already members of the church, already a part of it, who'd been baptized and gone through their, their own catechism, would, in order to encourage those catechumens to be with them, would participate to some extent in, in, this, in this teaching, in this fast period. And it became then, you begin to see by, I think it's about the 6th or 7th century, references to the fast being for people already members of the church, a time of remembering, a time of remembering what it was like to be without Christ, of what it was like to, to be uh, apart from the church, and entering into a kind of time of, uh, a, a time in the wilderness, as it were. So these two things, the seven-day, what became Holy Week, the 40-day fast of preparation for catechumens basically sort of merged into what we now know as Great Lent and, uh, and the celebration of, um, of Holy Week. And they both, I think, to this day, keep this character. They keep, obviously, the preparation of Holy Week. Clearly, we're preparing all of the services are, are guiding us to think about, to meditate on, to enter into the suffering of Christ and ultimately into his, into his resurrection. But it's also a time in which we are, in some ways, we're, we're for, I'll get into some of the details of, of, uh, of what else is, is happening uh, in, those, in those 40 days, uh, maybe in, in, uh, in just a bit, but preparation uh, and, getting, and, and getting, getting ready, and also, to a, in a certain sense, renewing our own baptism uh, is, is one of the ways that um, uh, uh, Father Alexander Schmemann describes it. I should maybe even just point out to you, if you're looking for sources on Great Lent, this is the two that I'm kind of working with primarily, uh, this book by Father Alexander Schmemann is just an, an excellent resource, as is the introduction to uh, this book, which is the Lenten Triodion, which contains most of the, service, the unique texts that we'll, you'll hear in church uh, during Lent. So I, probably our bookstore has both of them, but they're, they're really, uh, really good resources. So in addition to these two things, Holy Week, 40 days, there's also the biblical precedent of 40 days. There's 40 is a biblical number that crops up in all sorts of places, and 40 years of fast, or 40 years, 40 days of fasting is something that crops up at, in a number of places in the scriptures as well, and seems to probably have shaped that 40-day that fast um, uh, preparatory for baptism in, in the earliest church. We have, of course, the Israelites spending 40 years in the wilderness after coming out of the slavery of Egypt. We have Moses fast, going up on Mount Sinai for 40 days to receive the law, fasting for 40 days before that. We have Elijah who journeys to Mount Horeb and fasts for 40 days uh, in that process. And then, of course, most importantly, we have our Lord himself who immediately after his baptism goes out into the desert and fasts for 40 days. And that's, that's um, uh, a crucial uh, example that I want to come back to in just, in just a second. There's even, I don't know how widespread this is, but I just came across this recently, that a, a, a particular Saint Caesarius in the 4th century said that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden for 40 days, and there they kept the fast. That is, they didn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they were forbidden. It's an interesting thing. I've only seen it from that, in that one location, but an interesting kind of corollary to Christ's 40-day fast in, uh, in the wilderness. All right, well, let's move on to these three components of, or actually, I should just ask any questions before, before we move on? Just at, at any point, stick your hand up and I'm happy to take questions. All right, let's talk about these three, three aspects then that, um, that identified a fasting, of prayer, and almsgiving. This sort of group of, of three uh, comes to us from the gospel, of, from the gospel which is read on the Saturday and the Sunday immediately before Lent. Put together, it's basically Matthew chapter 6. And in that chapter, um, our Lord says a, a number of things. He says, first of all, when you give alms, don't go out with a trumpet blowing it. Don't do it to, be, to attract attention to yourself. Do it quietly. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He says, when you fast, 
don't make a scene of it. Don't look all dismal and wear uh, ratty clothes and stuff. Wash, look normal. Don't try to draw attention to yourself. And when you pray, he says, don't shout it from the rooftops. Don't do it as the hypocrites do, but go, go into your closet and pray to your father in secret. So these three things are given to us right at the beginning of Lent on the Saturday and Sunday preceding in the gospel as sort of, here's our activities uh, for Lent. So that's, that's sort of where, where this group uh, uh, has, has come from, from that, uh, that gospel lesson. Let's take a look at, at, uh, at the fast then. This is, a, the, the, and in many ways, that's what this is, is a fast. And it, it's perhaps one of the most misunderstood or easiest to understand aspects of, of the Great Lent, the keeping of the fast. We get a, some crucial ideas of it in this text that I've given you right at the beginning. Let us purify our soul and cleanse our flesh and as we fast from food, let us abstain also from every passion. That this is the goal of fasting, that it's to purify ourselves, that is to, t to rid ourselves of those things that corrupt us, those and which are ultimately our sins and our passions. And it's something that we do not for its own sake. We don't abstain from certain foods simply because that's the rule. We do it for the ultimate end of enabling ourselves to abstain from our passions, from, from giving in to the sorts of uh, uh, sins that, that beset us and the sort of temptations that, that come at us. Well, why, why fast? It's kind of a strange thing to do, right? To decide bo to, to eat less food, to pick out certain foods that we're not going to eat. Where, what's the point of this? What is it, what is it that the church, and, and indeed, this is something that's universal to religion. Basically, if you think, can think of any major religion in the world, they have fasting in some form or some way. Well, what is the Christian understanding of fasting? Why, why is it that, that the church gives this to us? Um, again, it begins, the, the, our, our services are our teachers. We stand at the beginning of Great Lent on the Sunday in which we commemorate the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise. That fact is crucial. The, the notion uh, that, that, that what the church wants us to do is to remember that as we begin this, what we are attempting to do is to recall where we have come from or where we have fallen from, what we were created by God to be and how we have got to the point where, we've, where we're not that, where, we've, where, we've, um, uh, where we've, we've, we've lowered ourselves. That's where, where we begin. So what, what, is, what are human beings in, in paradise? What, is, what, is the, what are human beings before, uh, before their disobedience? Well, they're a part of God's creation. They're a part of God's ordered creation. Um, Genesis spells out in, 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 great, uh, in, in great symbolic detail the way that God first creates the heavens and the earth. And then he creates the, the, uh, the creatures, uh, the, the plants, and then the creatures. And then on the last day, in the culmination, he creates human beings as kind of the cap of his, um, uh, of his, of his creation. Human beings, in many ways, uh, sum up his creation. We have everything that is in, in, that's in the created order resides in us in a certain way. We have, the, we have the earth within us, we're made of elements. We have water in us, we're made of, we're, whatever it is, 80% water. We have in us also, we're animated like the animals. We have bodies and muscles and, and brains and all of these different sort of things like the other animals. But we also have a soul given to us, the, the element of, of, uh, of the divine that's placed in us. So we have everything in the created order is located in the human being. And it's ordered in a certain way, that God creates it so that the soul, which is in communion with God, is served by the body, which is given to us to, in, to enact our love for God, to, to live on this earth, and to look after creation. So that the, the, in the same way as the cosmos is ordered with God, and the angels, and human beings, and the animals, and the earth, and all of these kind of things, so too we were meant to be ordered internally. Um, uh, in the garden, and this is a point that uh, Father Alexander Schmemann makes, in the garden, Adam and Eve eat. It's not like they don't need food. God gives them every tree in the garden to eat, except for one. He says, take, any take from any tree that you want, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the on the day you eat of that one, you will die. Father Alexander says that the point of food then, and you, you see this in, in the commentary of a number of church fathers, the point of food in the garden, the point of Adam and, Adam and Eve's eating was for the sake of communion with God. 
so that while it fed their bodies, of course, and kept them alive, it also was a means by which they gave thanks to God and were in communion with him. So that by eating rightly, by eating those things that they were given by God, they gave thanks to him and maintained communion and relationship uh, uh, with him. And this is what it is to be a human being, to live, to use what's been given, what God has given us, to give thanks for it, and to make it a means of communion with him. In the disobedience, this all gets broken. Do you recall why Eve eats in the garden? Do you recall how Genesis phrases what, it, what her reasons are? Anyone? Serpent comes to her, leads her, takes her to the tr- or shows her the tree, suggests to her, eat this fruit. You won't die. God said you would die. You won't die. He knows that in the day you eat of it, you will become as gods, knowing good and evil. And then it gives some reasons about what she thinks before she eats. Do you remember what those are? It was pleasing to the eye. That's the first one. What else? Pardon me? Curiosity. It, it seems like she's, she's obviously interested in it, certainly. Yeah, so it, it, it's pleasing to the eye. She saw that it was um, desirable for making one wise. There's one other thing. Yeah, that's, that's the argument that Satan sort of implies. Is that what he says or what does she say? She doesn't, she doesn't say that, at least in the, in the scripture. She does say that a little bit in Paradise Lost, if you're thinking about that. <laughs> the, last, the, the second thing that she says, it's, good, it's pleasing to the eye, it's good for food, and it's valuable for making one wise. Well, think about all of those things. The first two are direct appeals to the... To, to her body, right, to her physical senses. She sees it and it's pleasing. Moreover, she looks at it and says, that would taste really good. That would satiate my hunger. So notice what's happening. For all of the other trees, these are means of communion with God. These are food that has been given to them by God. This one has not been given to to them by God. Again, what Father Alexander Schmemann says is that she eats that tree for the sake of the food itself, for the sake of eating and taking pleasure taking delight in it, not for the purpose of communion with God. And that's what comes out in this notion that she sees it as desirable for making one wise. Well, God is the source of wisdom. God is the one to whom they go for wisdom and learning and, and, and all of that sort of thing. To eat of this tree that he is explicitly forbidden is to sort of side, try to sidestep God, to sidestep the commandment of God, and to attain, to become, as the devil had tempted her with, to become as a God herself, not needing God for, for food, not needing God's com- communion with God, but rather being independent of God. So it's an act of, of, uh, of independence and, uh, from, rather than of communion with God. This breaking of communion with God, essentially what Eve does is to become a materialist. That instead of looking at the material world as her means to God, her means of communion with him, she looks at it for its own sake and tries to find in that, uh, to, tries to find her life in that. And of course the result is exactly as God said it would be. She dies. And as does the rest, does Adam and the rest of, uh, rest of human, human beings up until the, up until the present day. And this is for the simple reason, Father Alexander Schmemann says, that she comes to believe in food rather than to believe in God. That the material world, apart from God, has no life in it. It's dead. Eve and Adam, apart from their communion with God, have no life in them. They die. And when that communion is broken, our life comes from God. And when we no longer take it from him, but look for it in all of the other places in the world that he's made, we realize that they don't have any life in themselves. We, you see this visibly when you go to your garden and pick some food and bring it in and it's beautiful and it's good and all those kind of things, but it's dead, right? You cut the life off from it and it'll keep you going for a little while, but not for very long. You're going to have to go back to it. These things have no life in them. Our present state then, the state that we've fallen into through the sin of Adam and Eve 
and through our own sin, our own reenacting of that in our own lives. The state of being fallen, of being sickened, of being broken, is a state in which we habitually over-prioritize the material world that's in front of us. Our jobs, our, our dinner tables, our cars, our, the money that we're making, the house that we have. This is what it is to be fallen, to think only about these kind of things. Look at your day. How did you spend your day? Probably, what did I do? I did some work on my house, tried to figure out something that was going on with my furnace. I did some work for my job because I had to do that. I uh, flew out the driveway because I had to be able to drive out of there. My, m almost all of my day, and then I spent some time prepping this talk, so I can put that aside, but almost all of my day is spent on sustaining my physical life on my interactions with the material world. This is, this is how we have become by virtue of being fallen. And we can't stop it either. We can't stop it. We, we're pulled downward. We're pulled downward towards, um, uh, from, from, uh, from, the, from what we had as communion with God. And then we spend our lives, if we're honest, in some ways, when, when, when all of this comes down, so much of this is an attempt to stave off death, is it not? We want a nice house so that we feel comfortable, so that we don't have to feel the aches and pains in our bodies that are knocking on our door telling us that death is coming for us. We want to have full stomachs so that we don't we feel satiated, so we don't have to think about the fact that death is coming for us. We want health so that we don't have to think about the fact that death is coming for us. This is the result of what, um, uh, this is what it is to be fallen. Well, that's the bad news. The good news is that Christ comes and he does everything that Adam and Eve should have done. He comes, as St. As Paul will call him, as the new Adam, the one who comes to recreate, to put human nature back in its proper order. And if you recall, that the first thing that he does after he's baptized, before he begins his ministry, before he begins preaching, before he begins uh, his, his, uh, his three years of healing, is to go off into the desert and to fast for 40 days. What happens when he fasts for 40 days? He meets the devil. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what happens when you fast. You meet the devil. Because of the fact that to fast is to go against the fundamental lie that the devil tells you, that your life is bound up in the, in the food that you eat and in, the, and in the, the material world in which you live. What is the first thing that the devil says to him? Turn these stones into bread. You're hungry. You need food. And what is Jesus' response? Exactly. He says exactly what Eve should have said to the serpent. That this, that this food is not, that this tree that's forbidden, this is not the way in which I'm going to live. This is not the way I'm going to become like God. The way I'm going to become like God is by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So he sets up this, this fundamental statement about what a human being is. We do not live by bread alone. That is the lie of the devil. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That that is the source. God's word, God's communion with God is the source of our life. So Jesus, in coming, refuses to seek for his life in food. He reorients human nature and instead of seeking for our life in the food of this earth, he gives us food that will actually be for, our, for, for eternal life. He gives us ultimately the bread and the wine that he, will, that he will consecrate at his last supper. Rather than running from death the way that we all do, he accepts the death that comes for him. And by, by dying, makes, of it, uh, makes, makes our bodies, once by letting his own body die, by suffering death in his own body, makes our own bodies once again capable of immortality. He remakes human beings, remakes human nature into what it was meant to be before, uh, before the fall in the garden. And so the purpose of fasting then is to follow in Christ's footsteps in this process to walk with him, to cooperate with him in the refashioning of ourselves, the remaking of ourselves and the reordering of ourselves. Hunger, 
hunger reveals, and I mentioned this already, hunger reveals our dependency. When we're not eating as much as we're asked to do in Lent, we feel hungry. And it immediately reminds us that we don't have life in ourselves. And the fact that even if I go to the cupboard and grab something and eat it, 10 minutes later or two hours later, I'm going to be hungry again. That food has no life in itself. I have no life in itself. That hunger, then, is meant to realize our dependence on God and to push us towards communion with him. This is proved very interestingly by the, by the radical ascetics who eat a tiny little bit of food. We're going to be coming to St. Mary of Egypt Sunday in, a, in about four or five, uh, or uh, three Sundays from now, who seems to have lived for 40 years in the desert on, a, I think, two loaves that she took with her from Jerusalem. The, some of the ascetic saints literally live on the word of God. It feeds in amazing and miraculous ways their physical bodies. That's the purpose of fasting. Also, the purpose of fasting is that it brings the devil because we are challenging where it's a, to fast is to make a practical assault on the devil and his kingdom and on the lies that he tells about us. And this hunger and this, this spiritual combat, to, to reference the words of the, um, uh, of the Stichira at Vespers, this is what our Christian life is to be like. It's very easy in, you know, during, during the year, you know, you're, you're, you're doing your things, you're living, your, you know, you come to church on Sunday, you have, you have a nice life, everything's going well, all that kind of thing. It's very easy to forget that the way that the scriptures continually figure the, the Christian life from front to back is as a battle. We are soldiers in the army of Christ, battling our foe, the devil. It's easy to forget that because we can be pretty comfortable. But Lent puts that in front of us, puts it in front of us that no, life, Christian life is a struggle. It's a war against, uh, it's a war against the devil who doesn't want us to realize the lies that he's told about us and the lies in which our world, uh, in which our world lives. And with prayer, when, when fasting is paired with prayer, as it absolutely must be, there's a way in which this hunger, this physical longing, this physical need can be converted into a spiritual need. If you've tried this, you, 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 may, have, you may have felt this, that that, that, that physical hunger can be spiritual, can be directed towards God, can become desire for God. So a couple of particularities then. What does the church, how does it define fasting? What, is it, what, uh, what does it ask of us? The first thing in general, and you see this in, in all of the guidance, is to eat less. Drop your calorie intake. And this is something that's it's just healthy. I think they, what is it, they estimate? Like 20, we eat 25% more calories than we actually need, especially in North America. It's closer to like 30% more calories than we actually need to be healthy. So that's the first thing. Eating less, taking in less food, so that we're not getting up from the dinner table feeling, oh. You know that, and you, then what are you going to do? You're going to go and have a snooze in your chair, or you're going to lie down on the couch. Are you going to go and pray? Probably not. So by eating less, you feel better. It, it works. In, especially in the first week of Lent, we're just past that now. Um, in, in monasteries, in, uh, if, and, and if, to the extent one's able, is especially a, a real cutting back of the amount of food. Some people will only eat one meal a day during that time. And the goal being simply to shrink your stomach. And you'll find that at the end of that week, all of a sudden, oh, I only need one scoop instead of two at supper because my stomach's not as big. You won't need as, uh, as much food. The basic principle that, that comes up again and again is simply don't eat until you're full. Don't eat until you're, ugh. Just leave that last scoop. Just, oh, I think I could take one more. Don't. Just back off like that. It's the, the um, uh, counsel that, that regularly comes up. Second thing, in addition to eating less, is not eating certain sorts of food. And in general, what, the, what it amounts to is the foods that are rich and the foods that make us feel heavy. Meat, dairy, uh, olive oil, wine. Those are the, the typical ones that, that the church, church asks, us to, um, asks us to fast from. The next thing the church always does as well is to immediately qualify that by saying, if you are new to fasting, if you are a catechumen, if you have health issues, if your work circumstances, if you're a construction worker walking around on the top of buildings who needs what needs his strength during the day, there are there are uh, there are modifications to this that 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 are given, and that it's something that's always done 
in accordance with guidance from your priests. Don't set out on your own fasting rule without talking to your priest and getting a blessing for, uh, for what, what it is you think you can do and what, what uh, the priest wants to see you do. It's always a, a crucial component of, especially when, when beginning uh, one's, one's life uh, in the church and one's fasting. The key then, the key principle that comes out of this then, though for the, for in the Orthodox Church, in, in some ways that is different than either the Catholic or some other Protestant churches, is you're not just choosing your own stuff. It's not just, oh, I'm gonna give up chocolate, or I'm gonna give up this, or I'm gonna give up that. No, you do this as a part of the body, along with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and you do it with the blessing and guidance of your spiritual father, because it's not just your own choice about, uh, about what you do. All right. And in addition to that, those are the, the kind of official rules of the church in terms of, uh, in terms of fasting. In addition, in recent times, a, a, number of, um, a number of theologians, a number of, of wise uh, spiritual counselors have really recommended, and a lot of people have taken this up, fasting from media of various sorts, whether that be film and television, whether that be social media, whether that be you know, just unnecessary interneting, um, that kind of stuff. There's, there's, this is something that intrudes in our minds in a way that I don't think any of the <laughs> Desert Fathers could have ever possibly imagined uh, the way that it can take over us. So that's something that I know there's even been some calls from uh, prominent theologians in the church to, to add this as a kind of, to add it to the official kind of canons about what the fast ought to be. But in general, you want your life to be conducive to prayer, which is our next topic. Oh, and actually, before I get there, a couple of things about what fasting is not, because it's easy to misunderstand. And, it's, and depending on the background that you're coming from, it's possible that you come in with these misunderstandings. The first thing is that fasting is not an assertion that the, wor that the material world is evil and that the spiritual world is good and that these two things are somehow separate. We're, the Orthodox Church is not dualistic. It's not Manichaean. This is, fasting is not something one does against the body. It's something one does for the body. That's a, and that's a crucial thing, to restore the rightful balance between the soul and the body. It's not a, ref, a refusing or a denunciation of the, of the, the body or of the material world as, um, as impure or as, as evil or anything like that. Second thing that it's not. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Barbara. Mention that I hear many Orthodox say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm fasting for God. Mm -hmm. That's the next thing. <laughs> yeah, because, and because he went through cross, I can't do Hmm. It's a kind of yeah, token offering. Yeah, if he can do that, then I can do this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, th so here's the next thing. Okay. We are not earning our salvation, by, or we are not earning points with God. I know sometimes, depending on Catholic circles, there can be a sense of kind of gaining particular merits for fasting and that kind of thing. This is not the orthodox understanding of it. God does not need our fasting. <laughs> we need our fasting. Fasting is not, and it's, and it's not a kind of gaining even of favor. It's not like now God won't, it's not an avoidance of punishment. It's a medicine that heals us. It's exercise that makes us well. It's not, it's not those, those things. The other thing, too, that it's not is it's not punishment. It's not we don't fast as a penance for something. Oh, I, I sinned, therefore I'm going to fast a certain number of days or that kind of thing. Fasting is not punishment to make up for sin or to make up for that. It's, it's medicine and it's exercise. That's those those are the metaphors the church always use for, uses for these things, are, the, are, are medical me metaphors and exercise metaphors. And that's, that's, the central, that's the central thing. Any questions about that? All right, well, let's talk a little bit about prayer then, the second, and well, not like it's second in importance, it's of, of um, utmost importance, and comes along uh, with fasting. And, and this, this pairing is, is based not only on the text that I just mentioned, Matthew chapter 6, but also um, the, the encounter that, Christ, that the disciples have with, with a particular person who's possessed by demons, and they're unable to cast the demons out. And Christ says to him that these demons will only come out through prayer and fasting. There's this sort of pairing uh, of the two. And what prayer does with our fasting is that it illuminates it, it activates it, it turns it into something useful rather than something that just makes us grumpy or makes us feel upset or whatever, it makes of it something, uh, something useful. There's two aspects, obviously, to prayer in the church. First of all, the prayer that we do together in services, and then the prayer that one does uh, individually at home. 
you've been now in a few Lenten services. What do you notice? What's the, what, are we, what are we doing? Is there, are we doing different things? Is it pretty much the same old, same old? What have you seen? Prostrations, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting addition that we don't do typically on a Saturday or a Sunday. A little bit longer, yeah. It's last Sunday's liturgy for those of you who first, first Lent was, uh, had a few more and longer prayers in it than, uh, than you're used to. What does that mean? Repentance? Yeah. Repentance. Repentant. Yeah, the theme, the theme of the text is, is repentance for sin, asking of forgiveness, acknowledging and confessing one's sin. What else are you seeing? Lots of psalms, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Different colors. Different colors, yeah. If you look around in the altar, on the, the banners on the icons, purple, a color of, a color of mourning. Yeah, all, all of these things. Um, on Saturdays and Sundays in Lent, so we've just had Vespers, this Vespers... I mean, it had some hymns particular to St. Gregory the Theologian. He was commemorated on the second Sunday of Lent, so that was unique in a certain way. But for the most part, there wasn't a lot of change in that Vesper service as from, from normally during the year. And even tomorrow in the liturgy, with the exception of the fact that it's St. Basil's liturgy, which has some different prayers uh, at the anaphora, for the most part, it's pretty, pretty similar. We're, it's the same service, mostly the same texts key thing is that during Lent on Saturdays and Sundays, Saturdays and, and this is even to back up uh, uh, entirely, Saturdays and su sat Sunday is always the commemoration of the resurrection. And that remains the same throughout the entire year. And so on that day, on the commemoration of that resurrection, it's, it's in a sense like we're stepping for a moment outside of Lent to go to fast forward to the end of it, to the celebration of Pascha at the end. That every Sunday is the remembrance and the and the re-entrance into into Pascha, and um, so for that reason, services don't look a whole lot different. But where they really look different, the ones that some of you have mentioned, prostrations, the extra psalms, is during the weekday. And during the weekdays, the Monday to Friday, is where we really see in the church services the Lenten character, the Lenten shape. Um, if any of you were here in the first week when we were doing the Compline of St. Andrew of Crete, there you noticed lots of prostrations, lots of uh, have mercy on me, O God, many prayers um, of repentance, all of that kind of thing. If you were at either of the pre-sanctified liturgies, you'd notice too that it's, on the one hand, it's a liturgy in which communion is, is offered, but at the same time, there isn't, there isn't the prayers that we typically do for the offering of it. This is part of the, 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 key, Lenten, the key Lenten characteristics uh, of, of the week, uh, yeah, of, of the weekdays. Um, <clears throat> and in some ways, what, what these weekdays are, they're days with, uh, with uh, I'll talk about this in just a second, they're days without the liturgy, the liturgy isn't celebrated, and they're days on which we are anticipating the resurrection rather than commemorating it, rather than, uh, rather than celebrating it. Um, so I'll talk maybe really just brief. I mentioned the canon of St. Andrew of Crete uh, already. And what, what St. Andrew does there, if you, if you heard this, is in, in every instance he reads primarily Old, the Old Testament and all of the various stories and characters in them. And he reads them in two ways. First of all, he reads them allegorically. So he'll say something like, uh, Jacob, there was Jacob and Esau, and he'll say something like Edom, or Esau, because of what he does, he gives up his birthright for a pot of stew. He's like, that is like you, O oh my soul, who are addicted to food. So he makes an allegory of those stories, reads them in a kind of spiritual sense. The other thing that he does is he makes all of those stories into my story. This isn't just some guys way back, thousands and thousands of years ago, but this is, in a, in a mystery, this is me. I do the same things. I commit the same sins, but their story is my story. And this is a fundamental, fundamental aspect of the way that the church reads the Bible, and especially the Old Testament, is that those aren't just his, history, but they're our story as well. The other uh, main uh, service that's, that's unique to Lent that, uh, that we do is the pre-sanctified liturgy, I mentioned that already. What it is, is effectively is a service that's Vespers with 
communion at the end. But it's not a liturgy where we offer the bread and the wine, where we offer the gifts to God and pray for the Holy Spirit to come down and to make them into his body and blood. What we do is reserve uh, uh, a, a lamb or some, of the, some communion from Sunday, put it aside, and bring it, and, and that's what's distributed uh, on, uh, on, on Wednesday nights at the pre-sanctified liturgy. And the reason for this being that during the week, we're anticipating not celebrating the resurrection. So there are no liturgies during, during uh, the week in Lent, as there would be normally. Uh, no, on weekdays in the year, you, there's many, yeah, so like a big feast day or something like that on a weekday would always be, would always be done. Is it, is it Vesperal, Father? Is it a Vesperal, litur Vesperal liturgy when it falls during the week? But it is a liturgy, yeah. I think, is that the one exception during Lent that we, where we do a, a weekday liturgy? Yeah. For, for Annunciation, which, yeah, March 25th. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, it's, yeah, so it is, I think, the one, the one time when a weekday liturgy could be served is for the Annunciation, because it's such a great feast. What is that, the Kyrio Pascha or something like that? Super, Super Pascha? Super Pascha. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wasn't the, yeah, it, it coincided with the, with the end of the Soviet Union the last time that those two came together. Yeah, that's really quite striking. All right, so th there's a little bit about um, uh, the liturgical services unique to Lent or our prayer uh, in, in those ways. Um, some of the aspects, some of the things that we see in those services can also uh, be done at home. So prostrations, for example, adding those to one's, uh, one's rule of prayer during Lent is, is, a, is, a, is a way of, of praying with your body. Also, one of the, the prayers that's inserted in many different Lent weekday services is the prayer of St. Ephraim. You will have heard it, um, well, during, during, during the week. Uh, o Lord, uh, Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, despair, the lust of power, and idle talk. Give rather the spirit of, and then a prostration, give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to thy servant, prostration. Yea, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own transgressions and not to judge my brother, another prostration. That prayer is a great one to incorporate into your own uh, morning and, and evening prayers at home. And in many ways, again, it's kind of a, a quintessential Lenten, Lenten prayer to be to have our sins healed, taken from us, to be given the grace of God, and to not judge our brother. Those three things. Um, another thing that's, uh, that, that's implied by, certainly by, the, for example, the canon of St. Andrew of Crete, and by many of the services, the service texts, is to take time to look at yourself. All of these prayers are pushing you to look at yourself. Look at your life. Where, where are you broken? Where do you need the healing of God? What are the sins that you need to overcome in order to, um, uh, in order to, be, in order to be whole? So taking time for self-examination during, kind of really focusing on that in Lent is a, re is a really valuable um, uh, sort of exercise. And along with that, going for confession regularly during, uh, during Lent as well. Another thing that's really helpful, I, I mentioned this already, um, is the, the many, the, the service texts, the unique service texts for Lent are all in this book. This is a great uh, resource to just read through, to pray through, to add uh, you know, to, into your own prayers at points, because it gives you all of the kind of, all of the texts, all of the, the worship that, it, the services that go basically around the clock in a monastery that we simply can't do uh, at a parish and we couldn't even come to anyways, if, uh, even if they were offered. So it's a great way to get at some of that sort of uh, stuff that we, we simply don't, uh, don't have. Last thing I'll talk about in terms of things to pay attention to or thing, aspects of prayer is to look at the lectionary that's given to us by the church. What, what scriptures are, were, were given to read on each day? Normally, during the year, it's always a pairing of a gospel and an epistle lesson. During Lent, 
all of the lectionary is Old Testament. And again, it's this notion that we're anticipating the resurrection. It's as if we're in, in the, the world of the Old Testament in, in, in a certain sense. So what we get are three books, or three and, and then a, a last one uh, towards the end of Lent. We get the book of Genesis, which describes, first of all, the good creation of God, the disobedience of Adam and Eve, the, all of the results of that, and then the beginnings in the calling of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Moses, the bringing out of the people of Egypt, which bleeds into Exodus, which is the last section, last, I think, week of Lent, we get into Exodus. Uh, it, so it gives us that, teaches us those basic foundational stories of who we are as human beings. We get the, the book of Isaiah, which is, the prophet, which is full of the prophecies of the coming Christ, the, com the one who is going to come and is going to offer himself, uh, uh, as we will commemorate it at Pascha. And then we get the book of Proverbs, which is this immensely practical book, how to lead a decent and ordered and moral life, the kind of basic ground floor criteria of what, uh, of what responsible Christian, uh, Christian ethical moral life looks like. So that combination, it's a combination that's especially fitted for people beginning, coming into the church. What is the life in the church? Well, here's the basic story. Humans were created for this, we fell for this, and God promised to send this. And what do I do with my life? Well, here's how you live it. Here's how you order yourself. So that's what those three books are. Um, so what is, what is lectionary? Lectionary is just the prescribed readings. For the day? Yeah, yeah. Yes, and that's this Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, and weekday difference. Yeah. Okay. And so those are things you can find on a calendar. calendar. Yeah, if you have, the, I think there's still a bunch at the back, the little church calendar with the saints of the day, and, the, and the, the, it's there. You can also find it on the OCA.org website. It has the readings that are prescribed for every day, um, and different apps and stuff like that have it as well. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for pointing that out. That's, that is another interesting thing, is that the gospel lessons uh, or the, sorry, the epistle and gospel for both Saturday and Sunday have their own sort of unique theme that run through all of Lent. In some ways, I, don't, I won't take the time to do it, but there's five different Sundays in Lent and they all have a particular theme. And underneath those themes are even older themes coming from, <laughs> from the original, uh, from the original uh, lessons that are prescribed. But really briefly, maybe, what, what the original readings, the earliest readings, were on Saturday and Sunday, it came from, the epistle came from the book of Hebrews, which is the account of Christian life in many ways as pilgrimage. We are, like the, like the, 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 the patriarchs of old, on a journey, on a journey to our, to our heavenly home. So it's the book of Hebrews, and the gospel readings tend to come from the book of Mark, where Christ comes and begins to demonstrate that he is the fulfillment of the prophecies and the fulfillment of the law, and ultimately will, of course, lead up to his, uh, to his suffering and death and resurrection. All right, any questions about that? Well, the last thing then, almsgiving. What are almsgiving? <laughs> the, the word used to mean something in English nowadays. We don't really know what it means. It means simply doing acts of compassion for people who are in need. Something practical, something tangible, not just, not just saying a prayer, though that's important too, and we already talked about prayer, but doing something tangible and practical for people around you who, ha who have need. Um, one of the, the most basic things, and this, this is uh, an ancient practice that goes all the way back to the, the second century, is to take the money that you save by not buying meat and cheese and milk and dairy and all that kind of stuff and give it to someone in need, give it to the poor. Some way. That's an eminent way that here your fasting is benefiting other people, that is, is uh, uh, working for the benefit of others. So that's, that's one thing that's uh, especially valuable. But everyone, this is perhaps the one that's where it's the least uh, easy to say, go out and do these three things. It's everyone has different lives, has different people in their lives, ha knows people that have different needs, is in contact with different people. One thing that, that, uh, that we do, at, uh, that, that a couple people uh, continue to do, I think, at St. Peter's, is to serve soup uh, on Saturday mornings to people at a downtown Bottle Depot. That's a great, great uh, thing to do, the Lord's Lunch. And really, just look, look at your life, look at, and see who in it you could benefit, who could you help. 
someone, and, and you know, you might say, well, I'll go and have coffee with my best friend. It's like, well, that's nice and beneficial, but do something for someone that you kind of, I know I should do something, but I haven't been. Push yourself to do something for those people that, that uh, something practical for those people around you that, that are in need. Yeah, in, the, in, the, where, in whatever corner, whatever place uh, that you find them. All right. In summary then, um, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, if, especially for those of you who are, who are newer to the church, to come through the journey that is Lent. And notice how that, that hymn sets it up, that this is a journey that we must persevere on, uh, that we will come at the end of it, the destination of this is, the, to, is to see and to, part, to participate in, to share in the death of our Lord and, to, and, and ultimately in his resurrection. And it's a beautiful thing to come through Lent, having made an effort in these things, try to fast, try to, to, to pray, to come to church, and inevitably you will fail, inevitably your, work, your efforts will be incomplete, but when you come having, with that, having given to God of what you can, and, and having attempted some degree to begin to chip away a little bit at the disorder that exists within, within you, um, that coming then to Pascha is to receive the, um, is, to, is to realize what you're doing all of this for, what the purpose of it is, this great and joyous celebration uh, of, the, of the death and resurrection of Christ. And it, to realize too that whatever efforts you have expended in Lent have only been given, the strength for all of that has only even ever been given to you by God. So you do this, you think, oh, I'm, I'm but ev even the ability to, to do this, the ability to attempt to fast, to attempt to love, to attempt to pray, even that is a gift from God. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to come to Pascha and to realize that, that gift, that, uh, that God enables us, allows us, and wants us to participate with him in our redemption and in making us whole and in making people that can truly uh, rejoice in and celebrate in his resurrection. So I'll leave it there unless there are any questions. It, the, they, they have the pre-sanctified more than once, or? Right, right. Yeah, so then they would have kept two, two lambs for, for, that, for those two different services. We, 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 we can do both of them. Um, Yeah, I, I should have, I was, I was meaning to mention that um, uh, tomorrow, sorry, but yeah, the, the idea being that it's, it's strength, if, if Lent has this journey, it's strength for the journey kind of midweek. For the, if, you're, if, you're, if you're struggling with, with your passions, if you're struggling to fast, it's a kind of halfway, especially on a Wednesday night, it kind of comes right in the middle of the week and it's a sort of strength to keep going. Is, the, is I think the idea. The need for, for the support of the body and blood of Christ on, on this journey towards, uh, towards what, Pascha. One, one yeah. interesting thing about it is if you were in a monastery mm -hmm. during these normal times, you have to buy everything. everything. <clears throat>
actual best uh, service at the, the Phoenix's offer is using those above and below sites. And I know that Manasseh or any of the other cities that they describe as a service. I would imagine there's probably b direction given by the bishop for at least a sort of minimum. Is, it, is that, or? service starts, blessings of God always upon them that believe in the Jews, we know that that's a monastic service, right, uh, that can be done for the judgment of God too. And when you hear the word blessed is the kingdom, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that is a, uh, that is a service requiring the bishop or the priest uh, in a larger setting to be able to do the service. So there's, there's two different groups of prayed that get there. There's prayers that the monks do. You should do all of those services at once. Right? Um, there are certain parts that a priest will go and do that you will do if that's right. But you can leave those church trips to one side or to phone. You can leave daily rest to the community at home to do that as a free on Sunday and so on and so forth. Right? So those are, those are all possibilities if they don't require the fullness of the church. Talk to the people in this room. <laughs> that's, that's one way, quite, quite seriously. And, and, I mean, you can, I think that um, it comes out in saints' lives. Uh, it comes out in 
I don't know, even just contemporary writers, bloggers, like Orthodox uh, bloggers talking about the experience of Pascha. There's this, actually, um, uh, what does it be? I think the Triodion begins with this account of um, St. Sophronius. Anyways, talking about, talking about the anticipation uh, of Pascha and how, uh, how it came at the end of Great Lent and was such a, what is he saying here? Oh, this, no, sorry, it's uh, Bishop, uh, Saint, now St. Nikolai of Okrid. We waited, and at last our expectations were fulfilled, writes the Serbian bishop, Nikola of Ogre, uh, describing the Pascha service at Jerusalem. When the patriarch sang, Christ is risen, a heavy burden fell from our souls. We felt as if we had been raised from the dead. All at once, from all around, the same cry resounded like the noise of many waters. Christ is risen, sang the Greeks, the Russians, the Arabs, the Serbs, the Copts, the Armenians, the Ethiopians, one after another, each in his own tongue, in his own melody. Coming out from the service at dawn, we began to regard everything in the light of the glory of Christ's resurrection, and all appeared different from what it had yesterday. Everything seemed better, more expressive, more glorious. Only in the light of the resurrection does life receive meaning. So, yeah, yeah. There's uh, another, and this this just comes to mind as well. Um, the journals of, I mentioned Father Alexander Schmemann, a uh, great Orthodox theologian of the last century. Uh, he, he, his journals were published, or a selection of them at least. And he, there's some just exquisite uh, accounts of his, just the, his own personal uh, sense uh, of, the, of the services, both, both the Lenten services, Pascha, and, and other times during the year. Just the sense of joy it just, that just permeates uh, his writing and his experience of, of life in the church. So that's another great example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If I mean, even tonight, at like the the service, most of the, the the particular hymns that we sang today, apart from those psalms and different things, but a good chunk of those were praising the resurrection of Christ. By it, we've been freed from death. By it, we've overcome, you know, uh, the, uh, the depths of Hades and all of those kind of things. It's constantly being thrown at you. <laughs> Well, we all have to go set our clocks ahead, so. <laughs> <laughs>